and take a moment to, hello, you are back with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Um, we are momentarily going to take up H-293 and hear a little more testimony, um, take another look at the language of the bill. Uh, before we do that, um, Rep McCarthy was in other meetings earlier and missed our votes on H-366, which is technical corrections. Uh, 227, which is Winooski Charter, and H10, which is um, permitted ex candidate expenditures. So Hal, why don't you tell him which you're doing uh, in, in what order, and we'll go ahead and record Mike's vote. I'll start with 366, uh, the technical corrections bill. Okay, I'm a yes. McCarthy? Yes. Thank you. Next, we have the Winooski Charter Change Bill. McCarthy? Yes. Thank you. And lastly, we have the uh, Permitted Candidate Expenditures H10. McCarthy? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Excellent. Thank you. So we are um, now coming back to H293 and um, Mike Merwicki was doing some work and having some cafeteria table conversations. So Mike, can you help orient us to, um, to where we are and who we, have, who we still need to hear from um, to move forward with this bill? Sure, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, is the... For those who weren't on committee last year, I'll just go back a little bit because we did start this uh, before break. Um, but we did a lot of the work last year. We heard from a number of students. We heard from uh, departments. And uh, I think we're not close to being ready to, to move this out. But I think we wanted to hear from, uh, we have another student here today. We have Holly Morehouse who's gonna speak as well. And then we have Cheryl Wilcox, who's uh, uh, with the Department of Mental Health. Uh, there were some concerns, I think, about moving uh, the structure for this um, for this for the youth council uh, away from the administration, uh, and we have answered those questions. And it seems like there's approval all around for it to be moved, but those people can speak for themselves too. So uh, I always like to hear from students first. So if we want to start off with Delilah, that'd be fine with me. Great, welcome Delilah and thank you. Um, please introduce yourself to the committee and tell us a little bit about where you're from and, and what your thoughts are on this bill. Yeah, hi, so my name is Delilah Kramer. I use she, her pronouns um, and I live in Underhill, Vermont but I'm a student at South Burlington High School um, where I'm in a student-centered project-based program called Big Picture. And through that, I really discovered the power that my own voice has and the importance in having students advocate for themselves, um, both in schools and on a bigger level, like what's going on here. So thank you for having me. Great. And Delilah, were you a part of um, the groups of students who were working um, during the summer and uh, and fall to 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 make some uh, modifications to the recommendations in the bill. Yeah, I was part of that group, um, and that was a really amazing experience getting to work with other youth from all over the state to do that. So yes, I was. Great, thank you. Well, uh, hang tight because we most likely will have committee members who have more questions for you. Um, so Cheryl Wilcox, would you share your thoughts with us on the bill? I would love to, thank you. Thanks for having all of us here. So just so you know, Holly and I and Sarah Chesborough, who works for the Department of Health, we chair the Youth Service Advisory Council, which is named in the bill. And having conversation last week, an agreement with the Department of Health, I'm here representing both of our departments in my interagency role, so what we're hoping is that there are a couple places in the bill where it calls out creating this within the agency of administration. We would love if we could change that to the Vermont Department of Health. 
And then there are a couple other places where it speaks about logistics and support to the Youth Council, and our Youth Service Advisory Council would be happy to provide that. So there are a couple specific places um, that if there were just minor changes, it would be really helpful, and I'm happy to uh, share that in more detail when it's appropriate. Great. Um, committee, any questions uh, with respect to moving uh, this from the Agency of Administration to the Department of Health? Sam Lefebvre. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Cheryl, for being here. Can we get a background a little bit of why? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so this is after coordinating with the agency of administration. So just so you know, there've been lots of conversations. I think because the Department of Health already has a very close relationship with Vermont After School and our departments co-chair the group with Holly, it makes it much easier to administer through our Department of Health than flowing through the agency of administration. So it really is just a matter of how it can be more efficient and effective for us. Peter Anthony. I just uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, my only um, concern has to do with the uh, resource effect from moving from the uh, agency of administration to health. Uh, obviously, health has got many, many demands on its resources. I just want to be sure that you're pretty comfortable that what you will need in terms of support for both the board council and the students, uh, you will have available to you in health, at health. Yes, that's a great question. And we've talked about that with um, thinking of the um, fiscal allocation being put at the Department of Health to pay the stipends. They have the resources to do that. Um, we've checked that with several folks at the Department of Health. And then our Youth Service Advisory Council, not only is it Holly, Sarah, and I, but we have about 15 other members and stakeholders. And so our group definitely has the resources and the willingness to support the Youth Council. Tanya Vyhovsky. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am curious, are you, I would imagine that the Youth Council would weigh in on issues outside of the scope of health. And so I'm wondering how that impacts it being placed under the Department of Health. That's a great question. I think because um, Sarah at the Department of Health, myself at Mental Health, and then we also have folks not only from other agencies, but also our secretary's office on the Youth Service Advisory Council, it's the full scope. So any issues that may touch any of our departments at AHS um, or the pieces that fall outside of our agency are things that we address in our Youth Service Advisory Council. So we would support the Youth Council the same way. Mark Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Cheryl, how would uh, this affect, I know that uh, it talks about in the bill um, that this would help the, uh, the progress in reaching the population level outcomes, which is again through our chief performance officer. Um, what, would the, what would that connection be with the health department? That's a great question. We, because the secretary's office and also in my interagency role, I have close connections with our performance director in the secretary's office, Drew Bresley. We would make sure that the data we're looking at in the Youth Service Advisory Council and what the Youth Council wants to put forward and focus on, we could make sure that all gets tied together. It's definitely an advantage of my role. It sits the Department of Mental Health, but being the interagency planning director is for the whole agency of human services. And it incorporates also working with our stakeholders outside of AHS. And I guess if, if I could, with a follow-up question, uh, do you now evaluate any um, youth um, concerns or whatever in, in any of any parts of your uh, provisions around this um, um, process. So I just want to make sure I'm understanding the question correctly. We There is data we've looked at and that we're tracking 
um, within the Youth Service Advisory Council. And I'm not sure if that's the piece or if it's um, something else. We, before COVID hit, we were actually working through a number of different data points of things um, that are facing youth in Vermont. So we've gathered information from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, our juvenile justice system, um, and where there are intersections with the criminal justice system. So we definitely have been looking at all of those, and we actually have it tracked and have had policy discussions. So it's something I'd be happy to follow up with um, to provide more. I'm not sure if that's answering your question. I guess so. I'm, I'm trying to find it now in here, but it specifically mentioned two sections of that uh, uh, statute um, uh, involving youth and uh, also, you know, inclusion of all Vermonters um, in, in that uh, in that survey. So um, I, I'm just wondering that that should have been out uh, March of this year, I believe. Um, uh, it's a it's an annual report, and I was I was just wondering again if the health department had any inclusive, you know, provisions around um, um, youth and and what what they've been saying. Um, over the past year. Oh, I'm wondering if this is specific to the Youth Risk Behavior Survey and the really thorough data we get from that, because that's a lot of youth data points. Um, and it actually won't be administered again until this fall because of COVID. It was supposed to be this spring. So there will be a delay. So 2019 is the most recent data we have from that, um, from that focus. But I'm looking through to see if there are other pieces mentioned here as well. So I think the piece around population level outcomes, that is a piece that um, we're focused on in our Youth Service Advisory Council. It just um, was put on hold the past few months as we've all dealt with COVID, but it is, and that's something we would look to the Youth Council to help us make sure we're focusing on the right areas. Thank you. You're welcome. Tanya, your, your hand is up. Is that from before? That is a legacy hand. Okay. <laughs> You must be getting tired. <laughs> Very. <laughs> All right. Um, any other questions from committee members for Cheryl? All right. Um, Holly or Delilah, anything you want to share with us um, regarding uh, the bill that we have before us? I just... Um would like to support the changes uh, that AHS and uh, Cheryl are presenting on that shift. Um, we do work closely with the Department of Health and it is one of the strongest agencies around youth voice um, in our experience, um, actually at the maternal child health division in particular. And um, so that does feel as a comfortable place for a home for this. I also wanted to follow up last time we were here, uh, Representative uh, Bahaski had asked about the draft application uh, that the youth had put together. And I did um, pull it off of Google and submit it as a PDF. Um, so it, it's there um, in your record. It is a draft developed by the youth um, over the summer. And um, as I said last time, it has not yet gone through uh, the process with the Youth Services Advisory Council and sort of that back and forth that would have to happen. But just to give you an idea of what they were looking for. Of course, thank you so much for letting me know that it's there. Sure. Uh, oh. And then um, I think Delilah and I are here just to uh, mainly answer any other questions as you work through the process. Super, Mark Higley. Thank you. Uh, again, I can't find that right off, but I did look at that application. Um, I guess I need a little background as well as to the who the Youth Service Advisory Council is. And um, looking at that uh, application, um, who is it that would actually be reviewing uh, those applications and, and choosing uh, which individuals, which students would be uh, become a member and which wouldn't? Holly, I'm not sure if uh, I'm happy to answer. And then if I miss pieces, please 
um, add. So the Youth Service Advisory Council, there are about 15 members. And um, a couple weeks ago when we were here, it actually, I'm happy to resend it. Our, um, the written testimony that Holly, Sarah, and I provided has a list of all of our members. So it's different stakeholders that are in the youth serving um, agencies. So places like Spectrum, Agency of Education, our different departments have representation. We also, um, obviously Holly, Vermont After School, we have Vermont Family Network and the Vermont Federation of Families for Children's Mental Health. So it's pretty wide ranging. And um, I would imagine, and Holly, you did a lot more work on this over the summer um, around who would review applications, but it would be a subset of that group. And Holly, I don't know if there are additional pieces you'd like to add. Yeah, thanks, Cheryl. So the, the reason that the Youth Service Advisory Council is tagged is in this idea that um, we want the Youth Council to succeed, right? So it's not about just sending the youth out, um, you know, to sink or swim. Um, and so the Youth Services Advisory Council is with um, this group of uh, youth experts who are there to support, but let the youth lead. Um, I would actually like to pass to Delilah, I think, to talk a little bit about um, how the youth envisioned the application process and the review and how youth voice could be incorporated along with the Youth Services Advisory Council. Yeah, so the goal was initially for the Youth Services Advisory Council to um, review applications and make the decision for the um, first batch, so to speak, of members of this council. And then um, since there are staggered terms in future years, members that are kind of graduating or leaving the council would help pick through those applications with the assistance of the adults from the Youth Services Advisory Council. So, so if I could, Delilah, um, you said that you had kind of a summer, you were involved in a summer study group in regards to this, correct? Can I ask if there was any individuals on your summer study committee that had a concern for Vermont traditions? That being a concern as far as hunting and fishing and maybe logging and farming? Um, sure, and correct me if my answer doesn't line up correctly with your question. Um, we were a pretty diverse group. There were, I think, around 50 of us. Um, so I think that was certainly a part of certain members' identities. Um, I personally have a small farm of my own, and I really enjoy and appreciate that. So I think, um, yes, certain youth are definitely interested in that, and I think others probably aren't as much. Um, does that kind of answer the question? Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Sam Lefebvre. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm not sure who this question would, or maybe a couple different answers to it. So the group that you guys did this summer, was, was that work paid? Yeah, it was. And I can't remember the exact amount, um, but I know I definitely enjoyed it. Um, so yes, and I think Holly might know the exact amount. We did set it up with stipends uh, for the youth um, for participating in in-person meetings. Well, they weren't in-person, live meetings virtually. Um, it was $30 a meeting. And then there were options for youth who couldn't or didn't wanna participate in the meetings that could do work offline. Uh, reviewing documents, um, and they were compensated as well for their time and giving input in different ways. Thank you. And a uh, follow-up is where um, where did that money come from? It was a grant that we had at Vermont After School around Youth Voice. Um, it was private foundation money. Mike Berwicki. I uh, just wanted to add that the, I believe, and, and Holly can correct me, that the Vermont After School had, uh, had been providing the funding for the youth stipends uh, because they had some money from a grant for that. But in the future, uh, this would 
um, come from the state budget. And that's why after um, the bill come, goes out of our committee, it's gonna to have to go visit appropriations. But we, we have had discussions already over there as well. And one of the prime sponsors is uh, Representative Landfear, who last year when this bill was up was, was on appropriations. So she has been uh, doing a great job as a champion for, for this for this bill there. I, I did have a question for Delilah, if, if we could. So Delilah, um, one of the pieces of this bill that I'm excited about is that there will be uh, a conduit for for students to have regular communication with legislators and, and the governor's office. Um, is that something that was talked about during the summer meetings? Yeah, that was actually talked a lot about um, because there's a lot of benefit both for youth to be able to um, communicate with those people, but also to kind of have it go the other way. Um, because I think there's questions and answers on both sides and um, being able to have kind of that back and forth and that relationship can be really beneficial. So yes, it was talked about a lot. And I think that was one of the things that people were actually most excited about. And without going into too much detail though, can you share a little bit more about some of the topics that came up that they felt um, the people in the administration and legislature should be focusing on that they might not be now? Um, yeah, I think we were, again, a pretty big group with a lot of different perspectives. So of course this kind of varied person to person, but um, youth mental health was a big one. Climate change was a big one. Um, students, I think there was a a lot of people saying, you know, right now we are in schools, we're experiencing Vermont's school system, and that that is definitely an area where youth can advocate more and should be heard more. You all set, Mike? Great. Uh, Tanya Vihovsky. Um Thank you, Madam Chair. In the initial review of applications for that first board, I heard a lot of agencies named, but I'm wondering if there's any youth voice in, because I, I heard that the afterwards, the graduating youth will review incoming youth, but what about that first board placed? That came up as well. And um, one of the thoughts that the, um, the, the youth group from the summer and fall recommended was that um, any members of that group who weren't applying or had aged out or whatever could work with YSAC and provide the youth perspective that way. I will say, I mean, you're absolutely hitting it throughout. They were always like, youth have to be involved in the selection process and in all the decision-making processes. So um, that was the thought on how to cover that gap until we actually have a, a state youth council. Thank you. All right. Any other questions for folks? Sam LaFave. Thank you. Um, and I know I asked this question when we were um, hearing testimony earlier, but looking at the application, and I still am, you know, besides the unique experiences um, and what you feel needs to be changed, I still don't see where we'd be making sure that we are having um, diversity when it comes to policy and going back to what Representative Higley said of making sure that Vermont traditions can still stay, um, you know, key to what we're talking about. So maybe Holly, um, could you be reviewing the applications? How are we ensuring um, that this is not just going to be um, one, you know, just, just partisan along policy idea? I, um, there was actually a discussion that the youth had at, at one point, um, and Delilah can help me remember, I hope, um, about whether uh, like political party or something like that should be asked. Um, and they decided not to, um, to do it that way. They um, actually instead were using the, the, and once again, the application is not final, but the, the idea of the questions that are posed there to, to get at what issues do you care about? Um, 
you know, what would you bring? What are you already, you know, advocating for or thinking about um, is where they were trying to get that sort of glimpse into um, where someone is coming from. And then to use that process through the selection process with the YSAC and the youth who are involved to then build that diversity there. So if there were, um, like I said, the application is not final, but if there's a way or you have suggestions on like how to tweak that wording to also get it some of that, the pieces that you're trying to ask about the perspectives or issues that you would bring forward, I'm, I'm sure um, the youth would welcome, you know, looking at that and figuring out how to integrate it as well. Um, Thank you. I I just know for me, uh, youth, when a lot of this stuff had come up, so I'm 25, it wasn't that long ago that I was sitting, you know, in high school and um, I, I was not represented. Um, and that and that's what's kind of driven me to be where I am. And that's why I'm here today to make sure the voices that aren't represented are. Um, so I represent a rural population along with most, most Vermonters. And I would just like, I'm not sure how your setup will work, but I would just like to make sure um, that you guys get some feedback from, there are some really great um, um, coalitions and people out there that would be more than happy that they, they have no party affiliation, you know, like the Abenaki Tribes, um, Vermont Traditions Coalition, and a couple of others that will come in and just give background to some of the things of like, how, how did we get where we are today? What are we looking at? Um, and why things might might be where they are. Um, as I said, when I was when I was in high school, I was the the kid, the girl that got picked on because I, I would hunt and I was fish and I would come in from working. Um, I wasn't, a, I didn't fit any sort of click. Um, so I, um, I really want to make sure that a younger version of me gets her voice heard um, and, and represented in this, um, especially if it's going to be something that's going to be paid. Um, that's a really big responsibility. And I understand this is a advisory board, but you know, with all due respect, we're going to take what you tell us and we're, we're going to listen to you. And that's something really big um, to be put on your shoulders. Um, and so I just want to make sure that the, all the voices are being heard. So I appreciate your time today. Thank you. I believe really strongly that we have the same goal about all voices. Um, I'm thinking this group really focused on how would you do this? So they, they didn't focus in their discussions so much on what their issues were that they were coming with. It was more like, how, how would we create a youth council? What would it look like? We did have a group that was a predecessor to this that was uh, the Declaration of Youth Rights. Um, and that group did have um, young people from, you know, that were hunters and fishers along with new Americans and talking about gun rights in the same room. and and um, in different experiences. And um, I think that what, what our approach and the approach of WISAC is, um, is how we do that, that outreach, right? That's so, so important. If it's just a blanket thing that gets, you know, posted on some email and then youth with resources or connected families are the one, only ones who see it, then it's not gonna work, right? So it's really that outreach that, that I firmly believe in, which is really through the youth serving organizations and, and you know, finding those unlikely voices and all the different voices um, and, and encouraging them to apply. I think that the other piece that the youth talked about a lot was that, yes, there's the youth council with the 28 young people, but what's really important is that every young person sees this as a way to have a voice. So that's why in the bill, some of the recommendations about um, yes, being able to have public meetings, but also being able to, they talked about like doing regional outreach, doing, um, you know, surveys, like finding other ways. So even if there's a young person who's maybe not like, not quite ready to apply to be on this, but wants, you know, has a positive experience of having their voice heard um, through a channel, and then maybe the next year they apply or, you know, we really need to think about a lot of different ways for a lot of different voices to be heard Um in different ways, because not everybody's going to speak up in the same way. And I, I think that that underlies like some of their recommendations and how they would do outreach and incorporate youth voice um, in different ways. I can appreciate that. And I think the development and, and uh, gelling of this council will evolve over time. Um, and uh, so I appreciate understanding the, the work that has gone into it so far. Um, anyone 
else have questions or any of the folks who are here to testify? Do you have any other thoughts that are prompted by any of the questions that have been asked so far? Can I say one more thing that might, <laughs> I was thinking too, in the bill, the way it's written, it has the youth council meeting with you again as a committee. Um, so that might be also a good um, checkpoint to check in on some of these um, you know, who's on the group, how are they, you know, what's the representation, how's it working with WISAC, and there's also language in the bill um, where they, the youth can also make recommendations for how to change how things are operating if, you know, we get into this and, and it needs to be modified on how often they meet or, or however or how selection is done. So um, I, I do really appreciate um, Representative Lamfer and, and Mariki and all the co-sponsors for thinking about those aspects as well. So it's not a one and done, but it's a chance to sort of grow and learn through this process with some checkpoints built in. All right, Mark Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair. I guess I do have one more question for Delilah. I asked this question uh, of the other student last time. Um, so 28 members seems like a, a rather large group to me. Um, again, how are you gonna keep it uh, diverse as far as uh, regionally goes. Um, you know, ag again, uh, it's, it's pretty spread out, but uh, uh, how, would you, how would you work that for the ruralness compared to uh, the more urban areas? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, I'm gonna ask Holly to step in and correct me if I get this wrong, because we discussed so many solutions to this that I'm honestly not. 100% sure which one made it into the bill. Um, but I believe what we settled on was um, have it be somewhat proportional. And there is, I think, a minimum amount of two from each county, um, two students from each county. And then there were a few extras to give to larger counties. Does that sound about right, Holly? That the, the recommendations from the youth were there would be at least two from each county plus um, they, they had talked about having like 30 to 40 members, but when they worked with the co-sponsors that seemed too big. So right now in the bill, there's 28. So the way it reads now is there's at least one from each county um, and then um, the others decided proportionally, but Delilah's absolutely right. They had thought of an even larger group. And like it, she said, they worked with 50 over the um, summer. So they were used to the larger number, but it does, have financial implications um, for the state. So they did shrink the number. So, so again, 14, one possibly from each county, but then the other 14 would be proportional towards population in a sense? I think it was a mix of population, but also that getting at that diversity piece. You know, so if, um, you know, they talked about, um, was a diversity of issues, but also geography. Um, so it would give some room, you know, to have a mix that let's say there's already someone from Newport and they actually live in Newport city and we need something that's more rural from that area or something, there'd be space to have a second one from, you know, from that county or something. So um, that was the basic idea. So at least everybody, every county gets one um, and then the rest of them would be used to build up that diversity. Thank you. Cameron, um, did you have something you wanted to, to add or ask, um, given that we need you to be able to help us draft this in the end? <laughs> I just <clears throat> wanted to add um, a little clarification about what is required in the bill versus there's a lot of discussion about what's going to happen during the application process. So in terms of what will be in the statute, um, the members, and I'm looking at uh, subsection B on page four, the Youth Services Advisory Council shall appoint members from an applicant pool with a focus on prioritizing um, diversity and inclusion, including characteristics such as county of residence, gender identity, racial identity, disabilities, age, and other characteristics identified by the applicants. There were prior versions of this bill that did require a certain number of people from counties and dividing up membership based on population. Um, those were over time taken out to give uh, a bit more flexibility um, to the Youth Services Advisory Council to get kind of the 
well, just flexibility um, in determining what's necessary, especially once the number of members was decreased from 30 to 40 to, to down to 28, um, which would be if you were to divide among the counties would be no more than two uh, members from each county. Uh, so once that number went down, the, the flexibility was increased a bit for how those members are appointed. Thanks, Amber and Mark. Are you back on this question again? I oh, am. If I, I'm going to let I you could. jump the line, then hang on, Mike. We'll get to your question, but go ahead, Mark. Um, no, this is maybe just a suggestion, and I'd, I'd like to run it by um, Delilah and, and uh, others that are here now. Um, so, on on page four, um, I believe it's no page five when it talks about uh, the council. Um, establish an executive committee, committees as needed, and the following standing committees. So you've got a youth voice committee, education committee, equity and anti-racism committee, climate change, and youth mental health. Um, would, you, would you object to, again, a, a Vermont traditions committee? Uh, again, the reason I say that is I just feel with what I see happening in Vermont and being from a very rural part of Vermont, um, the fear of, of a lot of my constituency is the loss of a lot of, of their rights that they have now for such things as trapping and hunting and, you know, firearm safety and shooting and so on. So uh, it's, it's just a question. I just put it out there and I would be happy to hear uh, your thoughts on it. Sure. So I personally would not um, at all be object to, uh, sorry. Um, yeah, I personally would be supportive of that. Um, however, the way that those um, committees were decided were by vote. We had a pretty long list of topics and then I think students picked like their top three or top five, something like that. And those were the ones that rose to the top. Um, so again, that was decided by a whole group decision, but I could also see that um, being another committee that gets added in later or combined with one of the others or um, something like that as we see how it goes. Thank you, Delilah. Mike Berwicki. Thanks, and I wanna thank the committee for, for this robust discussion to, to help move this along. Um, you know, personally, I, I would be reluctant for the adults here to be too prescriptive on what we want the students to take up, uh, especially since the, the sunset on this bill allows us to look at this again if we feel like it uh, needs to be tweaked in some way and, and moved in another direction. But I, I really feel that if, if we want to hear youth's voice, uh, we need that to be, um, pardon the pun, unadulterated, that the adults not prescribe what they're going to be talking about or what they want to, but it needs to rise up organically from within the membership of, of the, the student body there. All right. Um, Mark. Again, you know, I understand that representative, but I think from a perspective of the constituency that I know, the young constituency, a lot of times they aren't as vocal as a lot of other folks in regards to uh, their priorities. So I hate to just leave it. That's, that's, this is one of my biggest concerns. I think representative Lefebvre mentioned it too, is how to keep this from being a partisan group and uh, I, I think that's, that's key and, and maybe part of the way is to be inclusive right off with some things that, that a majority of them may not be concerned with, but it's a concern for, for some of my constituency. So uh, I don't know how we address that, but that's a big concern for me. Thank you. Sam 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and, and that's the point I was I was trying to make is my constituents here, um, that's that's their voices when I've met with them and talked with them. Um, and they're not the first ones to speak up. And I am yeah, glad that there are youth that are, are here and willing and uh, and wanting to work and wanting to, to make a point. But uh, I'm very scared that it, it's not going to be um, all voices. And, and that's what the big message I feel that they're trying to put across is. Um, and so... I would, I would hope that we'd have some room um, not to have the adults, you know, so forth dictate what the, what the children are looking at. I don't think that's what we meant at all. Um, we meant, you know, just to make sure that our voices of the rule were being represented just as much as others. Uh, so thank you. Peter Anthony. I just, <clears throat> going back to Amarin's uh, question about uh, what's in the statute as opposed to what we're urging be uh, taken up uh, as the group evolves. I, I am perfectly, uh, I'm comfortable with throwing out the idea, <clears throat> since it's a tradition in Vermont, to have a pretty strong uh, sense and identification of place to say there's nothing wrong with starting out with a sort of base, baseline uh, at least one person from uh, one representative, one council member from each county, and then let the rest ride um, on the theory that geographic diversity uh, at least makes a stab at what I think my colleagues are worried about. Uh, although it's not a surety, uh, because obviously there are uh, people who don't like trapping, <laughs> for instance, in Orange County, too. I mean, it, you know, but it's a start. It's a baseline. Uh, so I just throw that out for my colleagues to chew on uh, in answer to Amarin's uh, question. I wouldn't go beyond that because, uh, as my colleague, uh, Representative Marikli said, what's the point of having a youth council if, if they cannot formulate, if you like, uh, how they want to talk, who they want to talk with, and to whom they want to talk to? All right, any other questions for the folks who are with us or reactions from uh, Holly or Delilah or Cheryl? Go ahead, Holly. I wish I could bring all 50 youth <laughs> here right now. And I see Delilah, I, they, it was a very diverse group um, with all kinds of abilities and interests and backgrounds and family situations. And, um, and it was intentionally formed that way. And a lot of the processes and discussion processes um, we were doing to try out and practice to see how to support youth and having some really hard conversations and, you know, taking votes and moving into breakouts and, and, um, and listening to each other and, you know, co-editing Google Docs and making room for all these different voices. And I, I so wish, I know I, we, ha we have Delilah here today who's amazing and, and we had Una last time, um, but every single one of them and part of it's, you know, just the timing and, and getting them here with classes and stuff. But, um, you know, they, um, they uh, part of the process of having them in the room they're even more careful than we are I, I, and in a lot of ways for around, around the voices um, and building in different ways for youth to be, to be heard. And I hope that, um, you know, the youth that you, you are thinking about, you know, as this is established, um, you'll help us connect them right to the conversation to make sure, you know, their, their opinions and interests. That, and I think that that's kind of a thing that all of us adults carry, right? We can set this up, but then we have to support all the youth voices um, for connecting and being heard and, and, and learning how to speak up and, and join or banding together. Um, and um, so I think it's a, um, it's a wonderful process for us as a state. There aren't a lot of states that have, a state youth council to also work through and learn together and have that communication that Delilah talked about that was so valuable to them is, is being able to speak to all of you, but also hearing back, you know, what you're concerned about and how they can do. And they're going to meet monthly, um, you know, so it isn't something that's going to meet four times a year. They're going to meet monthly 
in the bill. Um, so there's a, a chance to kind of grapple with, with all of this and then come back with recommendations uh, for the next generation of how this is done. Um, so I really hope you'll, you'll give them the chance um, to, to, to try it out and, and to do this with you and, and with the General Assembly and, and with the governor's office. Delilah, go ahead. Yeah, I think I'd like to add that um, I also envision this as an opportunity for um, people whose voices aren't heard to have a chance to speak up and have a seat at the table. And that I think a big part of that will be making sure that everybody has the opportunity to apply. Um, and I think it would be great for when that time comes um, for you all to be able to help spread it to youth, especially the ones that you're concerned might not have a seat at the table to ensure that they know that they have that option too. So I think that might be a big part of getting those voices at the table is giving them that opportunity to speak up. All right, so committee, um, I think what I'd like to do is um, make sure that we are giving Amarin some clear sense of where we want to go with this bill. So I guess I'd like you all to go ahead and call up the bill. Um, and Amarin, maybe if you can take us through it just sec section by section and we can um, have a little committee discussion about what changes we would like to see. Yes. Does everyone have a copy of the bill in front of them? Yes, all right. So starting on, I will skip down to the section creating the council, which begins uh, section two, beginning at the bottom of page three. Section A is creating the council within the agency of administration to advise the governor and the general assembly on issues affecting young persons in Vermont. Shall I pause if I think there's going to be discussion or continue? <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, if I could, maybe a little more discussion on that. I, I just maybe need to know a little more information about why the agency of administration was considered first. I'd maybe even like to hear from Sue Zeller uh, to find out. Um, I found the section that I was talking about uh, down below as far as uh, what, the, what the two pieces would address. Um, let me see if I've got those. Um, page three, line 10. So, um, yeah, so it's under statute, you know, um, with the uh, uh, Vermont's children and young people achieve their potential. And then number nine, uh, Vermont has open, effective and inclusive government. I, I mean, I'd like to hear, I mean, this has been going on for a while, uh, where they're getting their information now in regards to that and if they've recommended any changes, because there's a process for that after each March, when that annual report comes out, um, recommendations that go to, I believe it's um, uh, submitted to the Government Accountability Committee. Um, so anyway, uh, again, uh, I'd just like to know a little bit more about, about that change from the administration to the health department before we make that change. So you would like to hear from Sue Zeller? I, I believe so, because again, I'd like to know what, if anything, they've done over the past few years in regards to those uh, two questions that uh, get answered through that uh, results-based accountability. Um, if, there's, if there's been any, where they get their information now uh, in regards to that, to the youth. Okay. Um, 
could you do me a favor and um, type up a specific question or questions and um, provide those to Andrea? And that way, when we ask Sue to come in and, and join us, she'll have a sense of what we're trying to get from her because sure. otherwise this might feel a little bit out of left field. Yep, exactly. Yep. Great. Uh, Peter Anthony, did you have your hand up? I'm okay. I'm, I'm okay. comfortable moving the word administration to the Department of Health following uh, Mark's comment. That's all I was going to say. Okay. All right. Back to the bill. All right. Time moving. I just right. had a quick question. Are the are I'm sorry. I'm looking at speaker view, not gallery viewer. I'd be able to answer my own question. Um, my question is, was the youth consulted on this move from the agency of administration to the Department of Health? I just, I, I don't personally have a feeling one way or the other, but I'm just curious. We didn't, um, may I, is that okay? Um, we didn't, um, so it, we have, there's a, you have like a rapid response team <laughs> that's the, that's a smaller group of the youth that are following the bill um, through the debate. So um, we've been doing large updates to everybody and then the rapid response team has been more on the where things get changed, um, you, know, or, you know, updated when it's quicker. Um, I don't think, um, I will also say also during the, the summer process, that wasn't part of their discussions about where it would sit with the agency, we talked a lot more about the Youth Services Advisory Council being the support body than what it meant to be with the Agency of Administration versus Agency of Human Services or Department of Health. So honestly, it just wasn't part of the, those discussions. Okay, thanks. Okay, now I think we're ready to go back to the bill. Okay. Moving to subsection B on page four, membership. The council shall be composed of not more than 28 Vermont resident youths between 11 and 18 years of age. And the Youth Services Advisory Council shall appoint members from an applicant pool with a focus on prioritizing diversity and inclusion, including characteristics such as county of residence, gender identity, racial identity, disabilities, age, and other characteristics identified by the applicants. As I mentioned previously, this was the section that used to, in a prior draft, require um, a certain number of appointments from each county. So I will pause here in case there's direction from the committee on this issue. Mike Marwicki, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm uh, hoping I can uh, digest and, and bring out a little bit of what I've heard from my uh, fellow committee members. And my suggestion here is that we do prescribe uh, membership to the degree that um, we wanna make sure there's somebody from every county. And so I'm gonna suggest that we add that we have at least, uh, you know, that first 14 be one member from, from each county at least. I'm seeing a lot of head nodding around the table and some thumbs up, so great. All right, next section. All right, so subdivision one on page four, uh, the agency of administration again here uh, shall assist the youth Services Advisory Council in notifying the public regarding the opportunity for youth to serve on the council. Uh, the Youth Services Advisory Council is the entity responsible for accepting applications and um, making appointments. The application process should emphasize the need for diverse qualified candidates and a successful candidate must demonstrate a commitment to inclusion and the use of the state and the ability to work with others and listen to others. Uh, subdivision two, the Youth Services Advisory Council, Council uh, shall appoint members for three-year staggered terms, um, striving to appoint members who represent a variety of youth in the state. The Council shall consult with members of youth advocacy groups concerning initial appointments to establish the Council, and then consult with the Council regarding appointments for all subsequent 
terms. I believe a prior version of this said um, consult with the council regarding, or excuse me, with um, outgoing members of the council. It sounded like there was, that was mentioned um, during discussion today, perhaps by Holly. Um, I don't know whether the committee would like to specify that that consultation will just be with outgoing members or whether the council as a whole should be consulted on the needs of council membership moving forward. Anybody wanna weigh in on that specific question? Uh, go ahead, Peter. Uh, thanks very much, Madam Chair. I, <clears throat> I'm a firm believer in exit interviews uh, in various contexts. And uh, while I don't think putting it in the statute is useful, I, I just want uh, the folks here to hear me say, I really think asking uh, some kind of critical questions of people whose term is up would be very useful. Thanks. Okay, Mark. Thank you. Another question I have, I don't know if it should be in this section or not is, has there been any consideration in regards to uh, uh, members who fail to show up for a certain number of meetings. Again, uh, if you're meeting once a month, that's, that's quite a commitment. Um, and a commitment of three years is quite a commitment. But if an individual misses eight out of the, you know, 12 month meetings, um, you know, I would think that, that you would want to move on and, and maybe appoint somebody else, regardless of whether they chose to, um, remove themselves. Uh, and I'm wondering if there shouldn't, shouldn't be some sort of stipulation around, uh, around that. Delilah or Holly, do you have thoughts on that? I can't remember if it was the previous bill last year. Um, and also in, um, in conversations with the youth, they talked about, um, at one point, or maybe it was the Youth Service Advisory Council, I'm sorry, we've talked about this a lot, but it was this idea that some youth could apply for a one-year term um, and some for two and some for a three um, to sort of get at that flexibility. Uh, you know, if it's, let's say a senior who's gonna be going away or something and, and only can commit one year, but really wants to participate. So that was, I don't see it in this language, but that was um, in there at one point, there wasn't anything, um, that came up either over the summer or any of those conversations about uh, what to do if youth don't show up. Um, I think that um, we did have, um, over the summer, there were most part people participated all the time. There were some that struggled to participate um, and we reached out and used local connections and youth workers to support them to try to figure out how best to to help them be successful. Um, and we kind of, we approached it through sort of an asset base rather than um, knocking you out because you weren't there, seeing it as a, as a growth process. Um, so that would just be a, a consideration I would just request um, because overall we want this to be a positive growth experience. So maybe the, I don't know if the language around the Youth Services Advisory Council supporting youth in being successful might help address that. Um, and then helping a young person who maybe isn't able to attend, you know, decide for themselves, maybe this isn't the right time or something like that. Um, just a thought on how to set it up. And Delilah, I don't know if you have thoughts or things that you've been involved in. No, okay. All right, Mike Marwicki, are you on this specific question? You need to unmute. Put my hand down, but um, I think this is a good idea, and um, I wonder if it's uh, something that we could put in for the students to set the the boundaries around this. And uh, I just want to make a little editorial comment, though, is that um, it's the kind of question I would have expected from Jim Harrison. So I'm just wondering if uh, Mark is channeling Jim now and bringing. Possibly, possibly. 
Thank you. John Thank Hannon. You. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I just want to note um, again that this sunsets on February 1st, 2025. Um, you know, if, if we find that members aren't showing up, we will have an opportunity very easily to correct that um, or to tweak other things that don't appear to be working out. Um, you know, so we will be revisiting this um, in the near future. And so it, it may be better um, on some of these issues to, to see what happens. And, and if it, there is a need for an amendment um, to this statute that we can take care of that um, in 2025. Good point, thank you. Tanya Vyhovsky. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would echo that I don't know that this kind of minutia on how people are appointed or removed belongs in the statute at this time. I think the youth have shown us that they are incredibly capable of coming together, working together and being responsible and creating those group norms should be left to them. And if it isn't working in a couple of years, then we can readdress it. Sam Lafave. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So I just want to follow up to that. You know, like this this group here might not all be together in 2025. So I think it's important if when we're here, we're working together. We were called upon by our constituents to be working and looking at this. And there's a lot of money being spent between now and 2025. Um, so that's something we need to take a take a look at. Um, it's it's a responsibility for us and it's a responsibility for them. And I do feel that. They're coming forward to do this, but we also need to be doing good by why we are sent here. And then my second question is, and I apologize if it has been uh, brought up, is so the age is between 11 and 18. And if an 18 year old goes on for three years, that means they're 21 years old by the time they're done. Um, do they have to be still within the state, even though they are a resident or could they be off to college in like California doing this? Um, and then what happens when you have a 21 year old working with 11 year old in a 14 year old by then? Um, have, have you guys looked at that of um, just the, the, the wide range you're getting because you could potentially have 11 to 21 year old um, or do you have it at 15 years old is when you can apply for a three year limit um, or is that, have we, have we looked at that? Anyone want to weigh in on how that's going to play out? Go ahead, Holly. I don't know exactly how it'll play out over three years, but I uh, will say that the group we had over the summer were 11 to 21 year olds. Um, and I, um, but we had, we had youth development professionals supporting them throughout the whole process. So in every breakout, there was a facilitator um, not speaking for them, but just to help with that cross. And sometimes we organized them by age and sometimes they were organized in other ways. So um, I, I, I key into, I think some of the scaffolding that is in the bill, like the Youth Services Advisory Council, like the opportunity to come back and look at, see how it's going, um, like the opportunity to make changes to the statute and um, to, to kind of support some of those pieces. Um, the group did not debate if it's an 18 year old with a 20, you know, that's gone on to 21. Um, I actually think that, and has left the state, I actually think it would be the other um, young people, that period of life, they're changing so quickly and um, and they're and developing and new interests and so forth that I, I actually, um, they move on to the next thing <laughs> in a lot of cases, you know, they, they spend, they, um, they're not a, in general, right? Like the, that's just part of the, the stage of life that they're in. So I would actually err on the other side of like, huh, can we get them to stay on for three years or can we get them, you know, like in that kind of place. And I think we need to have flexibility and sensitivity in that um, because someone who commits to this in ninth grade, you may be a very different person involved in very different things later on. So they may, you know, they'll need a way to gracefully step down if that's what happens and make room for someone else. And I think that that's part of the, the support that the Youth Services Advisory Council can, can bring um, to those, those processes. Excellent. All right, let's see if we can move through the rest of the bill so that we can 
give Amarin an idea of what we'd like to see in the next draft. So what I'm hearing on that last question is that we're leaving this as is for the moment. I believe so. <laughs> Subject to this group changing its mind, which it's more than welcome to do. <laughs> All right. So we left off on page five. Uh, the council shall elect a chair from among its members. Um, subdivision four, the council shall establish, and then it lists uh, the executive committee, ad hoc committees as needed, and then certain standing committees. There was some discussion about whether to add additional standing committees or whether to leave as is. Um, I don't know that, I think we may have landed on leaving it as is, but I just want to confirm. <laughs> Well, I guess I would remind folks that um, the process that the youth used in, um, in putting forward the ideas of these standing committees uh, seems to be very youth led. Um, and I, if we were to specify any, anything, I certainly um, wouldn't want to overrule the work that they've already done in, in looking at their priorities. All right. All right. Moving on to the bottom of page five, subsection C, powers and duties. <clears throat> this section outlines um, the council's uh, duties in terms of meetings. Uh, the council may meet at least one time per month. Uh, it does. It does not require meeting at least one time per month. Um, may hold up to four public hearings annually may gather input from Vermont youth through surveys or polls, may evaluate the state's progress in reaching the population level outcomes, um, and may recommend to the Joint Committee on Government Accountability any revision to the population level indicators for those outcomes. <clears throat> Moving on to page six, the council uh, shall, and this is required, provide advice to the governor and the General Assembly on policy changes necessary to improve the lives of Vermont youths. And that includes uh, the governor meeting annually with the council to hear and receive the council's advice and recommendations and the council annually reporting its advice and recommendations to the House and Senate committees on government operations and to any other standing committees it deems appropriate. And the report may be in verbal form. Peter Anthony. Uh, <clears throat> thanks very much, Madam Chair. Uh, back to the may as opposed to the shalls. I was waiting to hear the list. Uh, and uh, apropos of our earlier discussion about attendance replacement staggering terms, one year versus three, it occurs to me that one of the things that might want to be articulated just to uh, suggest to the council is something which uh, they may adopt rules of, to ensure orderly stability of the council and it's uh, executing its mission or some sort of uh, overarching enablement for them to run their own show internally without prescription, uh, but it allows them the flexibility to deal with some of the issues we just brought up. Uh, but I feel strongly that we should resist being prescriptive about it other than enabling. Right, other thoughts? All right. Let's cruise through the last couple of sections. Subsection D on page six uh, concerns the D and E um, concern the assistance and support provided to the council uh, by the agency of administration as it's currently written um, and the youth services advisory council. The assistance provided by the agency of administration would be uh, would include um, assisting with meeting scheduling and logistical support, providing information technology support, and providing any technology or technological devices necessary for the council to perform its duties. I oh, go ahead, Mark. 
Well, again, if we're changing that to the health department, that all has to change as well, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. And I will just say as a, as a general consideration for revisions to this, if the committee wishes to change this over to the Department of Health, this will be moved out of chapter 45 where it is currently situated um, in this draft, which is the agency of administration. And it will be moving over to, I believe, chapter 53 for the agency of human services. So there will be changes throughout this um, given that move. Subsection F on page seven, uh, meeting attendance. Members of the council may attend council meetings by electronic or other means without physically being present. The uh, General Assembly finds that virtual meeting attendance is particularly expedient for council members, um, but encourages council members to be physically present when possible. And then subsection G, compensation and reimbursement. Members of the council shall be entitled to per diem compensation and reimbursement of expenses as permitted under 32 VSA 1010 for not more than 16 meetings per calendar year. And for purposes of this subsection, meetings would include those up to four public hearings per year. And these payments would be made from monies appropriated to the agency of administration um, or the Department of Health, depending on where the committee uh, places this council. Mark Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sorry about this, but again, 11-year-old um, receiving per diem, any, any issues there? I mean, I, I don't know, I'm just asking the question. I can't think of any, um, but maybe others wanna weigh in on that. Okay, no, I just, I'm asking the questions how that, how that would work. Yeah, well, I know that when we're meeting in person, we have students who are 13 or 14 who are acting as legislative pages and they take home a salary. Um, it's always fun to find out what they plan to do with the money that they earn when they're working with us and for us at the state house. Um, anybody else have a question? All right, so um, Amarin, we are gonna need to, to move this over to the health department <clears throat> at the request of uh, the folks who are bringing forward this bill idea. Um, I have two people who need to, to bolt really quickly to 430 meetings. And I just wanted to um, say time out for just a moment so we can get them on their way. Um, we did not take an official committee vote earlier on the amendments to the technical corrections bill. And so I'm going to ask Hal to call the roll. And this is, uh, this is uh, to officially adopt the amendments that Jen Carby um, uh, described to us when we were working on the technical corrections bill. And that is the, the removal of those sections. And so Hal, when you're ready. I'll begin the roll. Gannon? Yes. Ricky. Yes. LeClaire? Yes. Cooper? Yes. Colston? Yes. Anthony? Yes. Behovsky? Yes. Uh, Lefebvre? Yes. Higley? Yes. McCarthy? Yes. Copeland Hanses? Yes. Thank you. 11 zero, zero. Great, thank you, and uh, my apologies for interrupting. So those of you who have uh, 4.30 meetings, we're just gonna finish up with the, the last little bit of committee discussion to give Amarin some direction on uh, bringing us back another draft so you guys can head out when you need to. Um, okay, so we have looked at, um, we've looked at all the sections um, we've talked about moving it from the um, Agency of Administration to the uh, Department of Health. Any other questions, comments 
uh, suggestions, ideas? Madam Chair, I don't know if this is appropriate to comment on. Um, so I look to you to let me know if it's not. Um, should you all decide to move this from the agency of administration to the Department of Health, the piece around deploying technology, we wondered if our Youth Service Advisory Council could help mitigate any barriers, but we can't deploy like laptops or phones to folks outside of our agency. So I just wanted to bring that up too in, in the, the drafting of this and decision making. All right, committee discussion on that. All right, uh, let's chew on that a little bit and we'll, uh, we'll figure out whether there's anything we feel like we need to do um, in that respect. All right, does anyone else have something that they were hoping to see in the bill that is not yet in the bill? Peter Anthony. I just, uh, I don't wanna be a dog with a bone who doesn't wanna let go. I just worry that uh, maybe the existence of an executive committee covers the kind of uh, enabling uh, authority that I had spoken about very briefly, that whatever internal uh, policies, rules, uh, behavior, um, appointment cycles need to happen, happen. I just worry that, that uh, there may be some doubt as to whether or not what the extent of self-governance is, and that's why I suggested some language about that, but I, I don't have any investment in it. I just want to be sure the group has all the, the marbles they need to, to, to load the, uh, the situation uh, towards, uh, towards a successful outcome uh, for the group for the first uh, several years before we revisit it at sunset time. I can certainly appreciate that. And I would guess that they will come back and tell us <laughs> if they don't, <laughs> since, since that is the, um, I think the, the part of the point of the council is that they will report back to us. And if one of the things they report is that they need um, a change to their own statute, um, we would certainly be happy to receive that. All right. So, um, I'm not seeing any more hands. Uh, Amarin, you've got a sense of what tweaks we wanna to make to the bill? I have two items that seemed definitive. One prescribing that uh, the council needs to appoint at least one member per county uh, and the shift over to the health department. Understanding that the committee may hear more testimony on that. Yes. That's all for now. All right. Um, thank you, Delilah, for being with us today. We appreciate your work in, um, in collaborating with some of your peers to put some really good language forward. Um, and we look forward to hearing all of the great things that, uh, that this council does if we're able to get this bill through, uh, through the legislative process. Um, and thank you again, Holly and Cheryl, for, for uh, helping guide that conversation and for being here to advocate for the bill. Thank you. Thank for the you. Today. All right, that is it for our committee agenda for the day, folks. We are back in committee tomorrow morning, and um, so we can sign off.